Welcome to the inaugural series of Radio Dramas, produced by the Tudor Arts and Hub in association with Writing Changes Lives, Carrick on Shore County Tipperary. This first series features three short audio plays, specially created for Healthy Ireland Keep Well campaign, supporting citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic, focusing on switching off from pandemic news and staying connected with each other. The Keep Well radio plays were created entirely in a virtual realm and are inspired by residents in three residential care homes, Green Hill Carrick and Shure, Melview and St Anthony's Clonmel. Residents were invited to talk about a time in their lives when the world was turned on its head, but everything turned out okay. The residents were remotely interviewed and shared a variety of inspiring and often very personal stories of resilience and challenges overcome. Writers from Writing Changes Lives created new radio dramas based on these interviews and three, one from each care home, were chosen to go into production. The three scripts were handed over to drama directors and a cast of seven actors, all associated with the award-winning Brewery Lane Theatre Group in carrick on and rehearsals began online. The final plays were recorded using a mixture of online meetings and digital recorders delivered to the actors. The entire project was completed on virtual platforms in eight weeks during lockdown three, spring 2021. Next up for the Healthy Ireland Keep Well radio drama series, first broadcast on March 30th, 2021, we bring you Kintsuki, written by Patricia Cantwell, directed by Suzanne Don, and performed by Maria Clancy and Neil Burke. This poignant, heartwarming short drama reveals how a character makes a beautiful life out of the broken pieces, like the Japanese art of Kintsuki, repairing a crack with a seal of gold. Sit back and enjoy. They keep the lights on here at night. (laughs) They think we're afraid of the dark. I'm not afraid of the dark, John. I've known the dark. Worn it like an old raincoat. Isn't it strange, John? Sometimes in the half-light I think I see you there, over in the corner looking down on me. Not as you would be if you'd lived all old and wrinkled like myself, but as you were when you left, your lovely dark hair and your laugh. Oh, your laugh. I think that was the first thing I fell in love with about you. Do you remember when we met? Of course you do. The whole world was in tears. We heard of these terrible things happening in Dresden and Hiroshima and places we couldn't pronounce. But I had your laugh and we had each other and the dark times didn't seem so dark at all. Do you remember the day we married, John? It rained all day the day before, bucketing it down. My mother put out the child of Prague the night before and I was up at dawn, couldn't sleep with the excitement. And the sun never shone as bright as on that day. And we settled into happiness, you and me. And the little girls came along. God, how you loved them. I used to chide you and say you were spoiling them. And all you do is laugh and wink at them behind my back. Oh, I saw you all right. They loved that. The whole conspiracy of it. Then, when we thought we couldn't take any more happiness, little Patrick came along. The neighbours all joked with you that you had your heir now and the dynasty was secure. (laughs) All you do is laugh. 
And then, oh God, John, when we thought we had it all, along came the darkness. Winter came early that year, frost on the bushes in October. You didn't feel yourself, though you never complained. They said it was only a, a routine operation. I visited you the night before and you hurried me off home. Said the children had been missing me and I wasn't to worry and when I came in the next day you'd be in a different room. And you were, John. You were. That was a strange Christmas, all right. Isn't it a strange thing, Annie? I see you as you were the first time I laid eyes on you. Your dark hair and your eyes. Oh, God. Your beautiful eyes. My friend Jim McCormack dared me to go over and ask you to dance. You were the prettiest girl there, Annie. Sure, I didn't think I stood a chance. My heart was beating like a hammer in my chest as I went over to you. And you said yes. I thought my heart had burst. I was the happiest man there. I surely was. They say that happiness is wasted on the young, but it wasn't wasted on us any. We knew what we had was precious even then, and we didn't waste it. We packed a lifetime of happiness into those six years. Six years, Annie. It might have seemed unfair. I know that's what everyone said, but they didn't understand what we had. Sure, how could they? And God, I didn't want to leave you, me darling. And I didn't. I haven't. You must know this. I never, ever left you. It snowed all day the day of your funeral. The grave diggers took twice as long to dig the grave. The ground was so hard. It was a hard winter. But worse was to come. The baby got sick. We thought nothing of it at first. He was always such a good baby, never a minute's trouble. But he went off his food and didn't look himself. Oh God, John, how I wished you were with me then. He got worse. And we took him to the hospital. It was the first time I'd been there since you left. The smell of the place, I still remember it. He diagnosed meningitis. I still thought he'd be okay. I, I prayed to God. I, I didn't think God could do it to me again. But he did, John. He did. The first daffodils were shown their heads when we laid him beside you. But I had to keep going for the sake of the girls. They missed you so much and they missed the baby. We didn't talk about it much. People didn't in those days. Thought it better not to be troubling their little minds, hoping they'd forget. One evening, I called them for their supper. They were out in the haggard at the back of the hay barn playing and they didn't hear me. I kept calling and calling and when I found them, do you know what they had? Ah, oh, John, his little shoes, the baby's black leather shoes, with the shape of his foot still in them. That was the worst time, Annie. I know what it was, but I was so proud of you, the way you put the girls first. What a strong woman you were. Little did I know when I twirled you around the dance floor that first time. What a great woman you turn out to be. Well, God had his plan. And sure, there's no way he'd have taken me from you and taken the baby. Only he knew how strong you were, how brave you were. I know how hard it was. Sometimes... I'd sit by the end of the bed on those nights and I'd hear you crying. 
I knew you cried when the girls were asleep so as not to upset them. Great big sobs. Oh, I wish they could have reached out and touched you. Told you everything would be all right. But, in a way, I think you knew. I knew that me and the baby were there. Always there. Otherwise, how could you have gone on? Isn't it strange, John? How we never called him by his name. It was always the baby, even though he was nearly four. Even the girls called him the baby. Do you know, it wasn't till I saw his name on the headstone beside your own that it hit me. Hit me right in the heart. John Patrick. Called after yourself. I said it over and over, rolling it on my tongue like a prayer. John Patrick. John Patrick. I suppose if he'd have lived, they'd have shortened it to JP, but he'll always be the baby to us. After you'd gone. Do you know the first thing I felt? Not sadness, no. Not grief, but anger, John. Hot rage and anger. Anger at you for leaving us. Isn't that ridiculous? As if you chose to go. And anger at God, too, for taking you both. Those were dark days. Then, that first spring, I went out into the garden down to where you planted the cherry tree. You'd always talked about planting a cherry tree and reciting a poem you learned in school. Oh, loveliest of trees, the cherry now. I can't remember the rest of it. You finally planted it when we were married a year. It was well established, so you said to take off no bother. You got it from Mick Hayes when he was clearing the garden after his mother died. You looked after it like a pet, but it didn't seem to do any good. I think you were a bit disappointed it didn't flower. Anyway, where was I? Oh yes, the spring after you and the baby had gone. It started to blossom. Not great big blossoms, but blossoms all the same, and after the hard winter and all, which was strange. Uh, maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, I don't know, but I took that as a sign that maybe things would be okay. I remember, too, the first time I laughed again. It must have been about two months after we buried the baby. I, I was caught off guard. Something one of the girls said, something silly. I can't remember. And I laughed. And I heard the girls laughing along with me. It was a strange sound. And, and suddenly a feeling came over me like I was being disloyal to you, like I'd forgotten you. Wasn't that ridiculous? And then I thought to myself, if you were here, you'd be laughing along with us. And that made it a little bit better. Sure, I was laughing along with you. All the time. And the best was seeing you pick yourself up and get on with it. As was always your way. I hated seeing you grieving and, and I wanted to tell you there was no need. Me and the baby are together. And we're fine. And the cherry tree. Oh, God. The cherry tree. I thought you wouldn't notice. But you did. You did. And I knew then that you'd be all right. The nights were the worst. That's where I'd do my crying so the girls wouldn't see. Oh, I must tell you this, John. Years later, I saw a play called The Hearts of Wonder. I don't remember what it was about, but I always remember the title. The 
hearts a wonder. And it is indeed a wonder, at the heart I mean. It gets broken, but somehow we manage to gather the pieces together and make something wonderful. <laughs> a bit like the, the little bits of broken china we used to play with as children, chainies we call them. I remember reading in the Reader's Digest years ago that the Japanese people put more value on the broken pieces after they're put back together with gold. Kintsugi, I think they call it. The art of the precious scars. And that's what I did, John. Gathered up the pieces and got on with it. And I did make something wonderful out of it, didn't I? Out of the beautiful sorrow. Your two lovely girls. God, I wish you could see them. They, they both have your smile. And our eldest has the exact same funny way you had of brushing your hair back from your forehead. <sighs> Cut my throat the first time I noticed it. I just turned away to hide the tears. But now it's lovely. I love to see it now. It's like you're here with us. And on their wedding days, oh, I missed you then. If only you could have seen them, you'd be so proud, like angels they were. I wish the baby could have been with us too. He'd have been a grown man by then. I think he'd have looked exactly like you. But then again, that's kind of nice, because he'll always be that lovely, smiling baby, never growing old. Wherever I went, I took you with me in my heart. And we had great times. I even took the girls and moved to a big town. I bet you can't imagine me doing that. And me, a country girl. Well, I did. And I liked it too, all the hustle and bustle. And I set up a little shop at one stage, selling all sorts of sweets, jelly babies, Peggy's legs, licorice, all sorts, and the rest. What do you think of that now? Bet you never thought I had it in me. And isn't it strange? I even found my singing voice again. The first time I sang, after you'd gone, it didn't sound like me at all, at least I thought it didn't. Like the voice was coming from someone else. But in time, it came all right. And became my own again. My darling Annie, what a life you've made of the broken pieces. Now, know this before I go, because I must go soon. Morning is creeping over the mountains, and the moon has waned, so know this. I have always loved you. My beautiful girl, my one true, lovely Annie. Before you go, John, I wanted to tell you this. A woman called here last week. She was talking about stories from long ago and how people got through hard times. So I told her all about you and the girls and the baby. And I told her about Kinsugi. The art of the precious scars. The art of the precious scars.
We have been listening to Kintsuki, written by Patricia Cantwell and directed by Suzanne Don. Annie was played by Maria Clancy and her deceased husband, John, was played by Neil Burke. This play was inspired by stories generously shared by a wonderful resident in a nursing home in County Tipperary. Sound engineer and editor, Pete Smith. This play was produced by Linda Fahey, Tudor Artisan Hub, in association with Margaret O'Brien, Writing Changes Lives. This Keep Well campaign is brought to you with thanks to Healthy Ireland, an initiative of the Government of Ireland, with funding from the Healthy Ireland Fund and the Sewing to Care Fund delivered by Pubble. Thank you for listening.